There's no doubt about it. Generative AI is already having a huge impact on our industry. And for a lot of people, it creates a lot of fear. Everywhere you look, there's another story about developers losing their jobs to AI. Big companies are laying off teams, small studios are shutting down, and more AI tools are popping up that can create game art, assets, even entire levels just from a prompt. It feels like everyone is racing to replace us. And for indie devs, it can feel like an even bigger gut punch. You're already working with tight budgets, doing everything you can to get your game noticed. And now AI is looming as yet another challenge, making things even harder. As if indie devs need one more thing to worry about. It's easy to picture a future where the market is just flooded with mediocre, AI-generated games. But here's the thing. That's exactly where indie or UGC developers have a massive opportunity. Let's get into it. Before we dive any deeper, let me be really crisp about my whole perspective on generative AI. I'm not against Gen AI. In fact, I think it's a fascinating new technology. We're already seeing how AI can absolutely unlock new workflows, speed up repetitive tasks. But where it falls short, and this is the key for you, is in creativity, intuition, and artistry. I just don't believe that AI can ever replace that human element. When I think back to my days working in the design pit on Diablo or World of Warcraft, there were so many moments where the solutions to complex problems didn't come from a formula or data. They came from deep conversations, collaboration, and those interactions that unlock that creative intuition. Like when we came up with features like Adventure Mode or fixing the loot design for Diablo, I just can't see Gen AI replicating that same level of craft. I do suspect that eventually we'll see AI tools that let you input something as simple as make me a side-scrolling game with a plumber and some enemies, and it will generate a playable game. But will it be great? No. Sure, it'll have jumping, enemies, and a controllable character, but it won't push the boundaries of what we can do creatively. It certainly won't be something like Animal Well and big companies are fully jumping on the technology. EA recently announced a massive investment in Gen AI tools as part of their creative process. Wizards of the Coast has shared that they're using it across the board for Dungeons & Dragons and are doubling down on its integration. Ubisoft also mentioned that leveraging AI is becoming key to their narrative tools. For these companies, it's all about reducing headcount while trying to keep up with the sheer volume of content required by their massive games. But I think they're heading in the wrong direction. They're looking at AI as a shortcut to content creation, but they're missing the bigger picture. This approach is creating an environment where players will start to distrust or become exhausted by the repetitive content that they're being fed. Sure, for now, people might enjoy the flood of content as they mindlessly doom scroll through games. But when every game starts to feel the same, players will eventually get tired of it. At the end of the day, all this AI-generated content is there to keep people playing, but it's not doing anything new or meaningful. The problem with AI-generated content is that it's just a recombination of what already exists. It can only draw from the data it's trained on. I believe the future will be flooded with AI-generated content, but over time, it'll all start to feel like noise. Just like those bad TV ads. People will tune it out. And when that happens, they'll start craving real, authentic experiences. Entertainment created by actual humans, not machines. And that's where you come in. As this divide between AI-generated and human-created content becomes more noticeable, the appreciation for genuinely handcrafted games will grow. The creators who use AI as a tool to enhance and unlock their creativity, rather than just pump out more content faster, are the ones who ultimately will win. 
And indies are poised to do this. In fact, many already are. If you look at the recent history of indie games, there's a common trend among the most successful ones. They push creative boundaries. They do what AAA games can't, and what generative AI won't. Take Bellacho, for example, which takes the familiar game of poker and twists it into a roguelike experience. Or Gris and their more recently released Neva, and how it seamlessly blends delicate art with gameplay. To Kill a God, which combines Slay the Spire's mission selection with Path of Exile's sprawling skill tree. Slay the Spire itself unlocked an entire genre of deck building roguelikes for us to get exhausted by. These games aren't just new, they're fundamentally unique, and they can't be generated by an algorithm. That's where your opportunity lies. This kind of creative authenticity is something only you can bring to the table. And as we move forward, we can see how that's exactly what audiences will value more and more. They succeeded by being experimental, by attempting things that wouldn't have been possible in environments where safe was the priority. These are games born from human inspiration, from genuine creativity, and that's something AI simply can't replicate. All that is easy to say, right? Be creative. <laughs> How do you actually do that? Well, some suggestions. Chase what you're passionate about. Passion drives originality. And if you're excited about a specific genre or mechanic, that enthusiasm will come through in your work. If you love strategy games, dig into that space. Explore fresh takes on established mechanics and create something that you would want to play but doesn't already exist. Lean into your strengths. Don't feel pressured to be a master of every aspect of game development. Play to what you do best. Take Nate Perkypile as an example. His art brought many Bethesda games to life. And then he went solo and made The Axis Unseen, which clearly leans into his experience as an artist. If you're a talented programmer, hone in on creating complex systems and mechanics instead of aiming for an art-heavy game. You don't have to do everything. Focus on what you excel at and try and team up with others for the rest of it. Combine ideas in strange ways. Innovation often happens when unexpected elements come together. As you play games, take note of mechanics or systems you enjoy and think about how you could combine them differently. Imagine blending Stardew Valley's relationship mechanics with XCOM's tactical combat. These strange combinations can spark entirely new experiences. Timebox your development radically. Set aggressive time limits for yourself, like one week to build a working prototype rather than taking months to perfect an idea. This forces you to prioritize the core mechanics that matter the most. By moving quickly, you'll see what's working and what's not, allowing you to refine your ideas faster. Release early and often. Especially in a UGC-driven world, the faster you release, the faster you'll know if your idea resonates. Don't wait until everything is perfect. Get a minimal version into players' hands and let their feedback guide your next steps. Iteration based on real-world input is really valuable when trying to build something that sticks. Finally, learn by doing. Game development is a journey, and it's all about building up your experience over time. You're not going to get everything right the first time, and that's fine. The key is putting in the reps. Just like learning to paint, every prototype and project is another step toward improving your craft. The more you create, the better you'll get at it. Of course, success here doesn't look like another Vampire Survivors clone. It won't come from churning out more life sims, endless runners, or simple platformers, especially since those are the kind of games AI will soon excel at making. It's going to come from pushing boundaries, from taking risks, and from challenging yourself to do something scary, something unknown. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I know many of you are funding your projects out of your own pockets, taking on gig work, or even making YouTube videos just to make ends meet. 
It's a grind, and that financial instability can push you to chase trends, thinking that it's a safe bet. When you see something like a vampire survivor's clone or the latest life sim blowing up, it can feel like following those trends is your safest bet to make a quick return. But AI can do fast follow way faster than you can. Like we said, AI tools are getting better at pumping out these kind of games really fast. That's why you need to avoid that as much as you can. It might feel like the safer path financially, but in the long run, it limits your creativity and the potential for you to stand out. The games that succeed, especially from indie devs, are the ones that break new ground and take risks, not the ones that copy what's already been done. As a friend of mine always said, there's no glory in playing it safe. Even with all this opportunity, the reality is generative AI isn't going anywhere. It's here to stay, and it's becoming an increasingly dominant part of our lives. So that begs the question, what is it actually good for? Well, I mean, tools. It's great for speeding up the way you work, whether it's tools that help you code faster or planning out complex tasks. AI can streamline the tedious parts of development. If you're already using autocorrect or autocomplete, why not use AI-driven tools to speed up your creative process? They're really not that much different. And the truth is, other indie devs likely already are. Back when I first started making games in the original Half-Life engine, I would have loved to have something to help me learn how to code, animate weapons, or lay out levels. AI tools can help you do that now. Beyond authenticity and creativity, there's one more area you might consider when looking at the future and how you can thrive. There was a time when people didn't carry around a small top-end compute device in their pocket when touchscreen was a thing of Star Trek. Then the iPhone came out, and some clever folks like Luke Muscat used Swipe to create games like Fruit Ninja or Angry Birds. Now we have a whole array of games that use touchscreens, and we play modern FPS games while waiting for the bus. These new forms of gameplay were unlocked by new technology, and I think we will uncover some new whole types of play that use Gen AI. We are already starting to see companies exploring this. Stanford created a game about a year ago with a number of sim-like agents, each with their own goals and desires, which played itself out with wild results. 1001 Nights is a narrative game where they use LLMs to turn your words into weapons that are created by the game and are completely unique to you. Or Retail Mage, a cooperative game which uses LLM to interact with items and customers however you want to solve their problems and try and earn five stars. There's also a slew of more obvious choose-your-own-adventure type narrative games, which are more like dynamic stories than games, but it's an interesting avenue. At the end of the day, success will come from pushing boundaries and staying true to your vision. I hope you enjoyed this video and that you found something valuable. I'd love to know, are you using AI tools in your development process? If so, how? How is it working out? Are you avoiding it altogether? If so, that's fine. Just let me know in the comments. If you are making a game, I have loads of other videos on design, including this one, where I get into the game loop of Helldivers 2 and explore why it's so compelling. You can check it out right here. For now though, thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.